Welcome to our conversation on Italian and international culture uh, of the Olga and Isa Ragusa Foundation for the Humanities. I'm Andrea Ciccarelli, the president of the Ragusa Foundation. And today for a conversation on Italian contemporary cinema, views and perspectives, uh, we have here with us uh, Professor uh, Roy Menarini, Professor of Cinema, Photography and Television in the Department of Arts at the University of Bologna. Professor Menarini is one of the most influential and active scholars of cinema and mass media in Italy. And through his video analysis on YouTube, one of the most familiar film reviewers as well. His field is vast and touches upon American as well as European cinema, TV series and cinephilia, web TV and films made for the internet. He has published on all cinematic genres and on issues related on technology and cinema, urban spaces, migration, film and other visual arts, film and literature, production matters, as well as specific directors such as Visconti, Antonioni, Pasolini, David Lynch, Cronenberg, Tarantino, Sorrentino, and so on and so forth, or iconic figures of film and cinema, such as Anna Magnani, Marilyn Monroe, Marcello Mastroianni, Sophia Loren, and many others. Amongst these books and editions, we can mention Il Discorso e lo Sguardo, Forme della Critica e Pratiche della Cinefilia, published in 2018, Cinema e Fantascienza, published in 2012, Il Cinema Europeo, written with Maria Pia Coman, published in 2006, Il Corpo nel Cinema, Storie, Simboli e Immaginari, published in 2005. Today, uh, in this conversation, again, we will talk about the situation, the views of Italian, views and perspectives about Italian cinema. And uh, the first question I would ask to Professor Menarini, to Roy, is that um, kind of a polemic question, if you like. Um, the question of an outsider, of a, of, a, of a scholar of literature more than cinema, who has heard since probably, since I was, since the 1980s, for sure, we hear that Italian cinema is in crisis, la crisi del cinema italiano. The term of concept has been used so much that it becomes almost difficult to understand how throughout these years of continuous crisis, a good number of Italian directors have actually been rather successful winning Oscars, Palme d'Or at Cannes, Gold or Silver Lions at Venice, uh, award, awards in the Berlin, New York, and many other, Toronto, and many other international film festivals. Uh, behind, uh, beyond any irony, of course, in the, is this crisis real, or has it been real at all? And when, in case? Or was perhaps, in good part, the residue of what we could call an ideological approach to cinema that envisioned two major fields, the Italian comedy on one side, tragedy on the other, as they developed from the 1950s on as a derivation of neorealism. Roy. Okay, thank you so much for your question. And uh, thank you also for your invitation. I'm very honored to be here. And uh, yes, I think you're right. Uh, I think that the belief that the problem uh, must be maybe divided into two parts uh, on a national level and international level um, about re the reception of cinema and the idea crisis, even uh, at the psychological level. So, for example, uh, abroad, uh, Italian cinema uh, lives on a glorious past, okay? So, for example, neorealism, uh, then the great authors of the 50s and 60s, uh, the film genre like uh, Western, Italian Western, Italian horror in the 60s and 70s, and then we enter in sort of dark uh, cone uh, um, up to the Oscars in the 90s, Tornatore, Benigni, and finally uh, the so-called uh, rebirth of Italian cinema with uh, Paolo Sorrentino, Luca Guadagnino, and other international directors. But in any case, uh, Italian cinema was seen uh, as part uh, of Made in Italy, 
UK uh, as studied by my important uh, colleagues like Peter Forgach, uh, Stephen Gandel and other um, big scholars on, on Italian cinema. And uh, together with um, a, a taste for Italian fashion, Italian food, Italian design, uh, and so Italian cinema was recognized to have um, an ability to talk reality, uh, appreciated together with the single director's uh, ability to be um, visionary, uh, stylistically rich, and so on. Uh, and so this created a myth of Italian cinema, and after the myth, you always have a crisis as a rhetoric. If you, uh, you were saying that it was really kind of a, a mythology, like a myth, created yeah. this myth of Italian cinema, and that, of course, after the myth, you always have the collapse of the myth. Yes, the this collapse. So, yes, but we are, um, the nostalgia is not about uh, only cinema. It, the nostalgia is about the, the country, the, the story, the country history from 45 to 70. Uh, I mean, uh, there was a difficult but exciting reconstruction uh, in which the country's economy uh, were uh, growing very fastly, society was modernizing, uh, habits and traditions uh, changing, uh, uh, well-being uh, spreading all across the population, and even the cultural industry in that period uh, completely uh, changed uh, its uh, processes and its uh, appearance. So obviously, uh, within this long period, uh, cinema goes uh, from telling only the harsh times of a post-war uh, era uh, to uh, depicting the problems of bourgeoisie. And we have a lot of, uh, of course, a lot of masterpieces, as you, as you, uh, as you know. But I think uh, we have we have a problem in that. So it's like we an almost infinite mourning with respect to the golden age as if the whole society contemporary society i mean had lost that creativity and so it's like we could not help but repeat in some way that uh, what has already been said so like sorrentino doing uh, again the fellini's films and a so sort of continuous uh, Postmodern remaking films from the modern uh, from the golden era. Uh, the idea of crisis uh, becomes both a condemnation for contemporary times and an excuse, because if no one can compete with Visconti, Pasolini, Bertolucci, or Fellini, so one uh, contemporary director just try to survive in the present. There is no ambition at all. There is a, a sort of excuse because the idea of crisis is the idea of golden age and then the decline, the rise and fall historical narrative is um, completely false. And at the same time is an excuse and a condemnation for contemporary times. Thank you. Thank you. This is very, very clear. Well, as you, we are talking about this, uh, uh, may I ask you as a follow up question, in a sense, uh, uh, what are the do you feel comfortable in talking to us about what you think they are the areas of cinema or Italian cinema today? What are the areas, the trends, call it as you wish, but I guess the areas because the trends sounds a little bit more re reductive, more the areas of Italian cinema. Yeah, OK, I, 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 I see. I, I can say that we can call them trends as well. But we have, uh, uh, I think, uh, um, the contemporary cinema is, uh, is rich, uh, is scattered in different, uh, in different little areas, maybe. But we have a, a rich product in every sense. Because, because uh, for example, international directors are there after a long time. Some of them I have mentioned before, 
eh, Luca Guadagnino, Paolo Sorrentino, Matteo Garrone, among the most important ones. But we also have an important underground scene of art house filmmakers uh, with more uh, radical cinema like Pietro Marcello, uh, between documentary filmmaking, experimental filmmaking and fiction films, Alicia Rorvacher, uh, Michelangelo Frammartino, others uh, with no success at all for the for the box office but at the same time they have um, an, an importance for film criticism and for uh, the festival circuit um, in in between something halfway in between we have also uh, some directors who, who balance uh, um, the the desire to reach the, the big public and the desire to be uh, art house filmmakers. So in the middle you have uh, uh, directors like uh, Paolo Virdi, Daniele Lucchetti or Gabriele Muccino who worked also in, in Hollywood for, for some years and uh, uh, being uh, the masters, the masters of Italian cinema uh, sometimes uh, always working like Marco Bellocchio or Nanni Moretti. So you have a lot different levels in contemporary cinema, but I want to focus on two um, specific levels, uh, which are, in, in my opinion, very interesting. One of them is Italian comedy that you have mentioned before as a, uh, a, 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 as a sort of myth of Italian culture, comedy and tragedy um, face to face. So Italian comedy, as producers know, is one of the only genre uh, that can, can make money in Italy uh, because it's a dominant genre unlike other uh, other uh, genre and author um, film or political films or uh, civic engagement films. Uh, mm, of course, uh, Italian comedy in, in film, in Italian film history um, has a lot of importance to the Italian comedy style in the 50s, in the 60s, uh, directors like Ettore Scola, um, Mario Monicelli, Pietro Germi, who are very famous also outside Italy, divorce Italian style being one of the most famous films ever uh, all around the world with, with Marcello Mastroianni. Um, the historical Italian comedy in the 50s and 60s um, uh, could uh, uh, criticize the modernization of Italian society, uh, laughing at the dark side of this modernization. But uh, this uh, recipe uh, seems lost nowadays, because uh, I think because contemporary society is no longer so easy to read. I, uh, maybe it wasn't so easy, but now it's very difficult to read as a society. Uh, in, in in the past, um, Italy had uh, a visible big contradictions between, uh, for example, modernity and tradition, um, fascism and post fascism democracy, uh, the Catholic culture and the communist culture, uh, and so on. But to say the truth, it's, not, it's now at least 40 years now that Italian society and Italian culture are not easy to understand and all changes every moment. And I think that only uh, a, an important comedian like Checco Dallone uh, could find a way for gigantic popular success depicting the average Italian citizen, the Italiano Medio in Italian, uh, with all his uh, schizophrenic approach to present contradictions of our country. So. I think it's not a surprise the biggest successes of Italian box office uh, come from comedies about big visible oppositions like in the past. Uh, Benvenuti al Sud, Welcome to the South. It's a comedy about different behaviors in Northern and Southern Italy. Uh, another movie uh, with big success, uh, Come un gatto in tangenziale, 
uh, is a love story between a left wing professionist and a populist proletarian woman. So you have uh, you um, you have the the most important comedies are comedies that find a way to represent visible contradictions as structure of uh, the film, like in the past. Other comedies um, are um, find very difficult to read and to criticize the laughing Italian uh, society. And second, uh, what is changing also today, perhaps, is the return of, of a film genre, uh, like in the 60s. So now we have thrillers, horror, crime films, uh, also musicals or, or um, superhero movies have entered the production horizon just in recent years. Uh, with, I have to say, uh, mixed results at the box office, but still promising. Uh, in particular, cinephile directors like um, Manetti Brothers with Diabolic, which is a movie about a famous comic series, uh, or uh, Gabriele Mainetti, uh, two superhero movies, Gig Robot and Freaks Out, the, the most recent one. Donato Carrisi uh, with the Italian Giallo, The Man of the Labyrinth with Dustin Hoffman, uh, are trying to discover new forms of representation uh, using the influence of masters like uh, Dario Argento or Sergio Leone, who are the, the, the tutelary gods of the creative relationship with the model, uh, with the model of American genre, of course. But the formula, the same of the 60s, imitation of American genre and reinvention of the American genre in an Italian way. Thank you, thank you. This is this is all very interesting and very 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 clear. Um, I well, you know, you mentioned uh, many names, and uh, I I wonder. I mean, as a this is really a spin-off question. That so, uh, uh, I wonder. You mentioned, for instance, uh, Alicia Rockbacher and uh, the fact that uh, her movies are successful critically acclaimed, but uh, not successful at the box office. And this is one of the many that actually have the situation. You also mentioned Kecko Zalone. And uh, so is Kecko Zalone, we could say, um, uh, in a sense, uh, uh, the new Alberto Sordi uh, of uh, Italian cinema, with, without making, of course, a comparison in terms of, uh, you know, aesthetic values and stature and so on and so forth. I'm just making, um, if you like, a box office or a commercial, uh, a critical a critical and commercial comparison, uh, in a sense. And at the same time, though, um, a question that I have is Kecco Zalone exportable, or is it just an Italian phenomenon as a comic, as we have many, of course, in the 1950s and 60s, the most famous example is, of course, Totò, who is the most important Italian comedian, of course, and comic uh, of the 20th century, but only in Italy. Already in France, they don't laugh. I mean, they, they, and I say France, or Spain, you know, imagine in, in Sweden or, or in, in English, it doesn't. So uh, this is a question that I have, as you mentioned, this comic and, com and comedy as a box office situation. Uh, yes, I think it's very difficult uh, to, to to distribute a film like this uh, abroad. I mean, Keiko Dalone has uh, not only uh, linguistic specific uh, gags, but also gesture are very uh, unexportable for international audiences. So uh, it's easier for national cinemas uh, to buy the rights of these films and try to remake them with local comedians uh, like Benvenuti al Sud, Italian successful comedy uh, made with an important French comedy 
because uh, even if the, this French comedy was released in Italy, uh, nobody had seen this comedy. It the flop at Italian box office, so they decided to buy the rights of um, uh, Welcome to the South, and they remade the movie uh, with Italian comedians. And I think that could happen also for the Lone elsewhere, because the Lone uses the uh, accent of uh, uh, Bari, uh, which is a southern uh, town, and also for uh, northern Italian people, it is not always easy to understand. I remember, for example, another successful comedian of the 80s, like Massimo Troisi, coming from Naples. And now we consider him a, a sort of myth, a, a, a great and a great comedian, uh, just a step below Toto. But uh, at the same time, uh, when the, his first film came out in 81, 82, remember, uh, Northern spectators uh, didn't understand what he was saying during the movie and asked for subtitles. And now, uh, now everybody understands Massimo Troisi because uh, um, also uh, the Neapolitan accent and dialogue is very well known uh, all over the world, thanks also to migration. Or Italy, I mean, um, thanks to migration and thanks to other products, audiovisual products. But I, I, it's just to understand how difficult it is to, um, to export uh, uh, not only in, in international market, but, but even international market, uh, different experience in comedians that are regional comedians. Uh, only Che Cosalone could uh, um, uh, could reach all the audience all over Italy, and it's because is uh, as you as you said before is uh, quite like Alberto Sordi, uh, because uh, he can uh, laugh about the Italian uh, problems and uh, stereotypes, but at the same time is sometimes tough is hard on Italian uh, on Italian people. Uh, so um, I, I, the, uh, the last film, Tolo Tolo, is very tough about uh, racism, about uh, uh, what is um, acceptable uh, for uh, in our uh, relationship with the stranger, with the migrant and so on. It, it's sort of mix between comedy and uh, um, civic political commitment, which is some, I think, surprising. Cozzalone. And that's why I think Eco it's, uh, um, it's like Alberto Sordi, because it's not only uh, about comedy, but it's all about the country, the identity of the country and the identity of the nation, even the identity which is not so uh, easy uh, to admit. Thank you, thank you. And by the way, it's very interesting what you said about Troisi, of course, um, because it's true, I remember seeing, watching one of Tro Troisi on TV with some friends from Bologna, as a matter of fact, <laughs> so you may empathize, and, uh, and uh, I had to, being from Rome, of course, I understand much, it was easier for me growing up to understand Neapolitan, and I had to translate some of the jokes, they, 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 I mean, they laughed because Troisi made you laugh anyhow, but I had to translate some of the jokes that actually was making, so um, this is uh, this is very interesting. Uh, thank you. Um, to change a little bit the subject and go uh, on another aspect, uh, go back to perhaps uh, something which is more um, um, uh, more theoretical. Uh, in one of your uh, essays, uh, you talk about political apocalypse of Italian contemporary cinema, or better, uh, you talk about. Uh, what has been seen as a political apocalypse in a, perhaps also in an ironic sense. Um, would you please elaborate on that and explain what is wrong and at the same time, what is actually true of this concept of talking about political apocalypse about Italian cinema? 
Okay, thank you so much. Uh, yes, I think the we have to start with the politics before to talk about cinema, uh, because the I, the apocalyptic attitude about uh, what's happening in Italy in, in um, history of contemporary Italy uh, comes from uh, the culture, the society and the politics. Um, I think that we have a lot of traumatic and symbolic events in Italy in the last uh, decades, like shipwrecks, uh, earthquakes, uh, um, dramatic crime stories and so on. So, uh, and it is precisely uh, 30 years ago, in 92, that uh, all uh, uh, begins um, from Tangentopoli, a huge uh, uh, political crisis uh, due to corruption of the political system, that Italian politics are marked with the metaphor of this idea of uh, uh, cataclysm and the uh, subsequent uh, um, revolution of the new. So uh, it is not coincidence that um, every political shock in, in recent um, Italian history, uh, like the Tangentopoli, the economic crisis of uh, uh, 2011, um, the, of course, the pandemics in the last two years and so on, is considered a preliminary and in some way also necessary for the palingenetic movements born from often from the extra political world i mean uh, after uh, tangentopoli you, we have berlusconi uh, as uh, from the world of entrepreneur entrepreneurship uh, so uh, um, the idea the rhetoric of the new uh, man coming from uh, outside outside politics um, after the economic crisis we have beppe grillo and the five star movement uh, from the world of civics uh, and led by a stand-up comedian like Beppe Grillo. So uh, I think we, we have a sort of um, another uh, rise and fall narrative in our uh, politic and, uh, and uh, also journalistic culture, but we can make also recognition of this strong uh, allegorizing tendency uh, uh, of Italian politics also in, in film, in films, also in cinema, studying some uh, characteristics, narrative and figurative uh, characteristics, which I think it's a probable consequence of the apocalyptic discourse and this uh, rhetoric of the national political confrontation. Just a few examples uh, that I want to give in uh, Arriva la Bufera by Daniele Lucchetti in 1992, 1991, one year before Tangentopoli, a story, um, a storytelling about uh, corruption uh, among uh, politics and citizens in the, in the south of Italy, and with uh, a volcano eruption, a symbolic volcano eruption. Uh, in the La Grande Belletta, The Great Beauty by Paolo Sorrentino, uh, in a sequence uh, we see uh, the main character um, um, sadly seeing, watching the Italian cruise ship Costa Concordia uh, struck, uh, which, which was a, a ship that struck an underwater rock and sank. And now uh, for a year, this ship was uh, like uh, uh, frozen uh, in, the, in the sea. And he watched, uh, the, uh, he watched this, um, this wreck. Uh, as a symbol of the fall and the sinking of Italian society and the metaphor of a human disaster. Another film by Sorrentino, uh, Them, Loro, in the second part of this uh, double feature movie, uh, the catastrophic earth wave, earthquake of the south of Italy uh, is described, of course, as a brutal event like it was, uh, but uh, up which a statue of a Christ is recovered from the dust by the firemen. So we have the, uh, an opposite metaphor. In this case, Italy uh, can uh, find uh, 
uh, a, a new, a born again attitude on his uh, present, its presence and future. Uh, another movie like Nanni Moretti's Il Caimano, The Cayman, uh, focused on Silvio Berlusconi. Uh, at the end of the movie, Nanni Moretti, playing Silvio Berlusconi, uh, invites all the citizens to a violent revolt against the judges who sentenced him. And the film ends with, uh, and I mean literally ends, actually ends with the flames rising out of the courts. And in Suburra, which is a crime movie and also a crime TV series, the story begins with a title written on the screen seven days before the apocalypse. And every chapter of the movie is preceded by six days before the apocalypse, five days before the apocalypse. Uh, the apocalypse being the moment in which Silvio Berlusconi uh, gives the resignation as prime minister due to the economic crisis. So uh, a lot of films use this idea, this metaphor of the ruin, of the cataclysm, of the apocalypse uh, to depict the, the Italian uh, changements in society and politics, which is at the same time very interesting, in my opinion, but at the same time, I think it's a sort of shortcut uh, to, uh, to easily uh, metaphorize uh, processes that are more complex than only apocalyptic, I think. But Obviously, it's a very complex uh, matter, and it's matter also for historians and uh, uh, experts of sociology. Thank you. Um, and we know that uh, geographical and symbolic limits very often intertwine in cinema, and Italian cinema is no exception. To the contrary, how would you uh, relate these two categories? that is both geographical and symbolic limits uh, or themes or topics in relation to the current scenario, uh, perhaps thinking about the immediate association with migration issues that we have been having in these past few decades. Uh, yes, I, I think this is too easy to um, just to um, interrogate the uh, actual and physical borders. I mean, uh, let me start with the geographical border, uh, in fact, um, and, and then go to the um, symbolic boundaries uh, in, in Italian uh, psychological geography, uh, if I can say, if I may say so. So uh, since Italy has been a landing place for African migrants for at least 30 years, for geographical reasons, uh, cinema could only deal with it. Okay, so uh, since the 90s, the, the immigrant has been viewed with a welcoming and um, compassionate look by Italian directors and screenwriters. Um, that's because uh, almost uh, uh, all of them are coming from the democratic, liberal and left-wing world of the culture. Uh, films, uh, therefore, uh, tell about exclusion, uh, race, uh, separation uh, and uh, path of uh, slow inclusion, uh, also geographic, I mean, of the migrant in context of uh, uh, bourgeois uh, characters who um, usually in those films uh, slowly realize the humanity of the migrant, the humanity of the host. And all these films have a, an optimistic gaze on the, on the stranger. Um, Nava Veloce by Carlo Mattacurati, 1996, um, Terra di Mezzo by Matteo Garrone, 97, um, recent films like Fuoco a Mare, uh, who won, uh, that won the um, Golden Bear in, in the Berlin Film Festival, and also Tolo Tolo that I mentioned before by uh, Keiko Dalone. Um, I would like also to remember what the uh, president of in Berlin, Meryl Streep uh, said about uh, uh, the Fuoco Mare film by Rossi, 
um, justifying the the award uh, to the to the media audiences, and she said, "This is like the neorealism in in the new century." So that's uh, another proof of how important the past. In Italian cinema is for international audiences, but uh, in other, in the other hand, we, I think it's more interesting uh, to talk about psychological and symbolic boundaries in Italian cinema. So uh, many films uh, um, like uh, Cuori Puri, uh, The Intruder, uh, L'Intrusa, uh, Lazzaro Felice by Alicia Rorvacher mentioned before, Happy Lazzaro, Sacro Gra uh, by Erosi, among others. So they identify spatial inner elements in places uh, marginally outside uh, the, the city, the, 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 the metropolitan spaces uh, of, the, um, of the Italian modernity and all or in communication routes, uh, usually unsuitable uh, for uh, sedentary life. And, set their own stories in, in these places, uh, finding big boundaries of separation between different, um, different Italy's, different kinds of the same nation. The characters often make paths, make journeys marked by these real and symbolic boundaries. Um, but also in crime films, if a certain production, for example, linked to the mafia and Camorra phenomenon exacerbates this dimension of the border between neighborhoods uh, as a clear separation between one's tribe, one's community and the enemy and the other's tribe and the other community. So um, also uh, from, a, um, fr from a representative spatial point of view uh, in, the, in this experience, uh, we have a, a perfect representation of urban discomfort uh, and not only speaking of the migration. So crossing the border is often prescribed by laws by regulations, by opportunities, by the risk of life, for example, in crime movies. So I think the most interesting uh, um, films in Italy dealing with the concept of border and boundary and geography is not only uh, the films that deal uh, literally with this subject, but uh, the films that deal in a, in a more symbolic way with these problems. And we discover a lot of films uh, uh, focused on the um, symbolic separation in uh, the tissue of Italy's society. Thank you. Um, very, very clear. Thank you. Um, the one of, uh, as I said before, when I introduce you, you have uh, worked on many different aspects of uh, cinema and mass media and television. One of the, your favorite subjects uh, has to do with cinephilia, uh, the effects uh, on distribution, reception, and perception of auteur cinema uh, in Italy, and the effects, I mean, on, on the audience, on the part of cinephilia. Normally, uh, and I say this also because of my personal experience, normally when we think uh, about uh, uh, cinephilia, we think about empty theaters with five or six people in it, uh, uh, or uh, we think about movies that are shown uh, well after midnight on uh, on the on the on TV, uh, but it is also true, and we know this in Italy. It's true that there are some programs that actually have become rather popular, not so much for the movies that they are shown because the movies may be obscure to most of the public, but for the way for the for the way the selection was made and for the way they were presented. I'm referring, of course, to programs such as Blob or For Your Radio and others, programs like that. Um, what is your assessment of the phenomenon and how did and still affect the knowledge of Ator cinema in Italy, if it has had an effect for you? Uh, yeah, uh, well, 
Uh, I have to go uh, go a little back in in history because, uh, of course, uh, uh, cinephilia has been and I think always will be a niche phenomenon or a particular gaze uh, towards films. Okay, but uh, anyway, in Italy, uh, cinephilia had a very particular history um, because it was not born from a specific magazine, for example, a film journal like Cahier du Cinéma. Uh, in France, it did not have a group of critics or theorists who then made films based on their cinephilia and their cinematographic culture. But in Italy, cinephilia developed different different phenomena. For example, uh, it immediately took on the characteristics of a militant and political cinephilia at the turn of the 60s and 70s is in the Marxist area uh, and through uh, protest movements. And I mean, they um, had uh, th those critics and uh, cinephiles uh, um, found in popular cinema uh, sort of a, a genuine culture against uh, the mainstream films uh, and the in institutional cinema of uh, the current Italian production in, in that period, I mean. So uh, it was a sort of uh, um, anti-canon uh, uh, revolution, uh, just like uh, the French cinephilia in, in the 50s, but with a strong political context. Then in the 70s and 80s, uh, it was a cinephilia that brought new attention to periods and genre considered unacceptable or vulgar before, like the comedy of the fascist era or the melodrama of the 40s and 50s. And then in the 80s and 90s, uh, like you have said, programs like For Your Ario and also the entire programming of the Rai networks sometimes transformed uh, the, the public channels uh, into the dream of a um, mass uh, uh, film club and, and a mass uh, cine club, cine club for the masses, we can, we can say. So uh, I think that uh, um, Cinefila in Italy had a lot of different uh, roles. Uh, sometimes it was uh, very, very useful uh, helping uh, film historians and academics uh, to um, to highlight uh, different periods that were considered, as I said, unacceptable or sometimes just creating new audiences. But one of the problems of contemporary moment and contemporary cinephilia is that I think it's now comparable to a fan culture. So when I say fan culture, fandom culture, I say something which is more about fandom and less about less about encyclopedia. So in Italy, we have a, a well-known um, media literacy problem in our schools, for example, on film culture and on the audio audiovisual heritage uh, that is better known abroad than at home. When I have my um, students coming from USA or coming from other countries, I notice that they know Fellini, Bertolucci, better than my Italian students, for example. And the subject, subject of screen literacy is huge. Basically, I think we have niche of informed the audience and cinephiles, um, but also a mass of people not used at all to think about cinema except as pure entertainment. And the, the, there is almost nothing in between. So especially among the young people, the film culture is, is very low at the moment and knowledge is uh, uh, increases only uh, when they choose uh, university courses like film studies and they deal with it. So I think um, uh, on a level a digital cinephilia has um, improved some of the tools for this niche 
but at the same time we have a lot of people not interested in films unlike uh, the um, decades before thank you that's uh, that's very clear um and very, very interesting what you said also about the fact that the screen literacy in italy is actually more of a problem that we may think uh, outside of a, of a niche and that uh, cinephilia is still of course addressing a niche of people um, you know a group of people and not uh, a large group um, one last question that i have for you um, thank you you've been very patient you've been very generous you've been with us for a long time um, is that um, in these past uh, decades we have seen many film directors working for the small screen meaning for the television initially i'm thinking about hbo rai in italy of course kai and so on and so forth that is already uh since the beginning thinking and knowing that they were going to make a film for the television and therefore aesthetically thinking also conceiving in that in that uh, way and in this past few years of course we this the small screen is even smaller because we are talking about the computer screen the laptop screen or the, 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 the smartphone screen. Um, I'm thinking about Martin Scorsese, of course, in his last movie made directly for Netflix, and he knew it would come out directly on, uh, in, uh, on, uh, on a computer, on a laptop, uh, and he made reference to that in, in the interviews in the, uh, the, around the, when the film came out. Um, the, do you see um, a reciprocal influence aesthetic influence or do you think this is uh, just uh, normalcy now something that we accept as normal and therefore we don't even pay attention anymore or is there still uh, a, a switch a steady switch between one and the other yeah, when yeah. Saying that hey, Andrea, I'm, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry i'm sorry oh i'm sorry do you see um can you hear me now yeah now i can hear you do okay you hear me? sorry okay okay um so the question is do you think uh, there is an aesthetic uh, difference okay, okay. in the approach on the part of the directors, the same directors, when they know they're filming for the small screen and not for cinema? Or do you think that by now this is actually almost a moot point, almost not a, non, a non-existent aesthetic point? Uh, well, I think now their part, uh, the, 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 the directors and products are part of the whole system. I mean, uh, Italy has been able in the last year years to rebuild a sort of industrial uh, credibility, and I think that it uh, starts perhaps from the operations of the TV series, for example, uh, in particular. Um, a cable TV like Sky, which is an international broadcast, but with an important uh, Italian identity, has developed important editorial projects such as uh, Romanzo Criminale and Gomorra, uh, always uh, uh, using the crime genre, which is one of the um, easier genre to sell abroad, uh, succeeding in one of the most difficult things for the Italian uh, which is to be distributed also in the global context of uh, uh, TV production. Um, crime genre is a universal language uh, to be protagonists of this, uh, of this era, of course, but it's not only about crime. And uh, uh, subsequently, also thanks to international operations, um, such as narrative formats, uh, I think about uh, the Italian version of in treatment uh, after the um, Israeli and uh, American version of it. Uh, we have an Italian version of in treatment TV series, Scam, which is a teen drama all well known all over the world and with an Italian version. So things got stronger uh, up to perhaps the most important operation. And I mentioned here uh, Lamica Gen the brilliant friend uh, coming from the famous novel by Elena Ferrante, co-produced by Rai, uh, public television, and HBO together. So uh, I want to underline how, how some of the most uh, loved uh, literary, so also literary, 
cinematographic and television narratives in the world revolve around Naples that we have mentioned before. Like Gomorra is in Naples, Brilliant Friend is in Naples, but also the, the Paolo Sorrentino is a Neapolitan director and, and focused on Naples, his last important movie for Netflix, The Hand of God. And many of the production companies involved um, makes also uh, films for the big screen, as well as the directors. Saverio Costanzo, uh, L'Amica Geniale, is a movie as, as a director also for the big screen. Uh, Claudio Cupellini, director of uh, a lot of episodes of Gomorra, is a uh, move from, moves from cinema to television and vice versa with no problems, no longer making major product distinctions. So I, see, I think that now this is the only way to stay in the global, on the global market and be ready for the new challenges of the future. And uh, the traditional stages of distribution have become uh, compressed and new platforms, new platforms have altered the scenario of consumption, for example. So the proliferation of these options uh, beyond cinemas and abroad offers uh, important opportunities for those directors, for international audiences, for uh, um, recalibrate also the notion of Italian cinema and Italian product nowadays. Of course, it's not a, a, a linear process. Um, it, it's a trial uh, with, with um, made by experimenting, uh, failing, experimenting again, uh, uh, trying to find uh, um, best practices. Okay, the Italian films and the Italian TV series now have achieved the visibility like never before because they consider themselves the same thing between the streaming uh, distribution and the big screen distribution. Now the big question is uh, what's happening next, um, especially after, and uh, I want to underline after, uh, hoping uh, it's, uh, it's uh, coming early, after the pandemics, because uh, during the pandemics, a lot of people uh, is uh, is now um, is normal for a lot of people to watch films on uh, a smartphone, on a laptop, and uh, using a lot of streaming uh, in their life. So it's not easy to uh, um, push those uh, audiences back to the big screen. And we have just seen that uh, in, the, um, in the last few months with the important crisis of Italian movie theaters. So, uh, okay, uh, I think it's okay to be, um, to, to be playing in different, uh, um, in different areas, to be ready to make uh, uh, products for the big screen or, the, or for the um, streaming uh, uh, platform and streaming audiences but we have to pay attention because maybe in the future one of the two sites the big screen movies uh, um, can could be not there again so you see this almost as an event in in inevitable in a sense the pandemic after all is just has been uh, besides being awful of course but has been uh, just uh, as advanced as as anticipated what what you think eventually will happen in terms of uh, habits in, in the near future? Habits, I'm talking about the viewers, of course. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Menarini. Thank you, Roy, for this wonderful conversation. Uh, this was wonderful. We hope to have you soon uh, with the Ragusa Foundation to talk about this, uh, about other aspects, of course, of Italian cinema and culture. And uh, thank you very much again for uh, all, your, uh, all your work and all your help. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you, Andrea, and thanks to Ragusa Foundation. I will be there as soon as possible when all the situation is better. Thank you very much. Thank you.